What up, y'all? Welcome to the Clockwork Podcast. Um, I have a really special guest for you guys, uh, a local one. Um, introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name is Brooke Tillotson. I'm a sophomore biology major from Cortland. Um, I'm on the women's basketball team at SUNY Cortland. I'm also, I have a minor in chemistry and communications. Um, I'm originally from Marathon, New York. I played for their soccer, softball, and basketball teams. Um, I had many successes at my high school level. Um, now I'm playing at Cortland, and I love it a lot. That was a great introduction. Thank Basically, you. I got from that you're a science genius. <laughs> you did really well in high school, and you're at Cortland. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about family. Hey, I know that means a lot to you, mm -hmm. um, and I've met your parents. I know your dad pretty well. Um, talk about all your family. So how many siblings do you have and all that stuff? Yeah, um, so I was raised by my mom and dad. Um, my dad was born and raised in Marathon. We actually kind of lived the same life. Um, he was valedictorian of his class in high school, so was I. We both went to Cortland, both are science majors. Um, I, hopefully, my plan is to get my PhD like he did, maybe from Iowa, maybe not from Iowa. That might be too similar to his life. Um, but he got his PhD at Iowa. That's where he met my mom, who was a gymnast there, getting her undergrad degree. Um, so they met there. They had me and my three older brothers. So I have um, Ryan's the oldest, then Jack, then Andrew. Um, they all live in different states right now, so we're all kind of separated. But yeah. we'll be together again at the end of May for Andrew's graduation from college. Cool. So that'll be our first time all being together for a while. That's so cool. Yeah. That's and awesome. then since I do fortunately go to school so close to home and play so close to home, a lot of my family gets to come to my games. So my aunts, uncles, most of our games, our entire fan section is the Tillotson family. Um, our men's team makes jokes that our women's games have more fans than the men's, <laughs> which awesome. is so true on the nights that my family's there, not, not any other night. <laughs> but, that's, that's cool. Yeah, but I really appreciate my family, and they yeah. have given everything for me to be where I am today. So That's awesome. Um, you said your mom's a gymnast. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of like, well, we'll kind of transition a little bit. But where did basketball come into play then? Right? Yeah. Like, did dad play? Like, who, where did this love for basketball come into play? Yeah. Say? Um, probably my brothers. My dad will always tell you that I got my basketball ability from him, but he's a liar. <laughs> he was at bench. He was bad. He was so bad. Um, my mom could not catch a ball to save her life, so it definitely didn't come from her either. Um, but growing up, my brothers would never let me play with them. They said I was bad, so I took it to heart and I got better. Um, but my brothers all kind of had their sport. Ryan was always a baseball player. Jack was a really good golfer. Andrew was kind of a jack of all trades, but mm -hmm. soccer was his main one. So I was like, all right, I don't want to be like any of you. So I chose basketball. And that was kind of the one that I was just naturally better at. Mm -hmm. And then once you're good at something and everybody keeps recognizing you for it, you're like, wow, let's do this some more. So then I, right. then I got even better at it and I kept working at it. And then yeah. it just spurred from there. Yeah, that's, that's dope. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, so after that, that love for basketball, right? And when did you, when would you say at what grade or what age would you say you realized that you were actually pretty good? Um, probably fifth grade. Early on, yeah. yeah. So yeah. and fifth grade was when my dad wanted me to play AAU for the first time. Okay. My my mom was so against this. She was like, "She's fifth in fifth grade. We don't need to be starting this and spending all this money this early." And I was like, "She had." Thinking now, she had a point because right, it's expensive. Right. It is, it um, is. So I tried out for CNY Heat, which is our right. local AAU program. Mm -hmm. And as a fifth grader, I was put on the seventh and eighth grade team. And I was like, oh, oh wow. Okay, so we're already going to start this. Um, and so I played, and I actually played well, and I started for them. And then it kind of just progressed from there. And it wasn't until my last year of AAU that I was like actually playing with people that were my age and my level. So gotcha. I was always playing up, and I just mm -hmm. really enjoyed it. So it went from there. Um, it's cool. You said a couple of things that were interesting to me, and I want um, the people to kind of hear it and touch on it. But um, I feel like there's this, there's this ever-growing debate, right, where people are like, do you want to go to a school where you are like, the one in charge, right? Everyone, everything goes through you. Or do you want to go to a school where you're constantly held accountable by other teammates because of how good they are, right? And obviously for you going to a smaller school, the one that you went to, um, a lot of the girls on your team weren't nearly as good as you and maybe even the girls that you played against. So talk about, I guess, the struggles or the, the challenges in that, right? There's a different type of pressure for you than there was for me in high school. You know what I mean? Strictly just because of who you had around you, yeah. right? Um, 
And for you, you constantly uh, met that challenge. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so my high school is very small. For those of you who don't know, Marathon only graduates about 50 to 60 kids a year. Um, so we have a very, very small basketball team every year. And my senior year, we had eight people. So if anybody gets in foul trouble, we're in for a day. It's over. Yeah. It's, it's over. Um, so I kind of had the role of having to score, having to make defensive plays, having to assist all the baskets, getting all the defensive attention by other teams. Um, but I embraced it. I really mm -hmm. loved having that role and my teammates having that relying factor on me. And then you get to college and you have the com complete opposite of that. Um, my freshman year, we had nine seniors on the team, um, so I knew coming in I wasn't going to play a lot my freshman year and I was going to take the back seat, um, and that's okay. I was very happy to let them do that for one year while I got my bearings, um, but going back to what you said about yeah. either being the team that runs through you or being on a team of people that are going to hold you accountable, experiencing both one in high school and one in college, I would much rather be on the team that holds you accountable. Yeah. Um, mainly because that team wins. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they do. And yeah. and I was talking about that too, because you're right, like, because winning is so important, but I always used to go to your games in high school and I used to think like, man, the mental toll. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like to mentally, to score 50 points in a game and lose, right? It's got to be so draining, mm -hmm. right? But also it's still draining to score 50 and win, but you did everything. Right. So like talk a little bit about it mentally, because we're going to kind of like dive into it as you get to college, the mental aspect of yeah. being an athlete. But I literally first thing I got to watch you do it, you know what I mean, at a younger age. And, and I, I was super impressed about how you carried yourself, but no one sees behind closed doors how you feel. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of hard because like when you're playing, you know, if you don't play well, then that's the game. Like if I in high school, I love my teammates to death. My senior year, we got a little better, and there was other contributing factors. But moving through my high school years, there was no other major scoring factor. There was nobody really there to help me. So in the back of your mind, if you have two back-to-back -back turnovers, you're like, well, if I don't score 35 points in this game, we're going to lose. Right. And so having that mindset every time, and then when you do lose, it's all on you, and it's just it's like an ever-bearing pressure. Yeah. And at times, you want that pressure. You want to feel that way. But then when it goes south, then it's one thing on top of another on top of another. Right. And it takes a big mental toll. Right. And so, like, for you, right, personally, like, how many – was there ever a moment where it went south? You know what I mean? So, like, I can think of a couple times when I was playing football where I was, like, mentally, like, yo, bro, what is going on? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that was in college. You know what I'm saying? That mm -hmm. wasn't That wasn't my whole high school career. And so that's a lot to carry. And so when you think of a moment that was tough, how did you get through that as well? Yeah. The moment that comes to my mind is funny because it was very early on in my career. It was my second varsity game ever. I was in eighth grade. Okay. We played against my twin teammates from um, Newfield. That was very good. And they box and won me the entire time. I was an eighth grader getting box and one. I had one point and I fouled out three minutes into the third quarter. <laughs> it was a very, very bad game. So, so who, who, who do you go to, right? Like, who, bad game, good game, but more, more importantly, like the bad ones, right? If it's not coach, like, who is it that you can go to and, like, be open about that stuff? Right? Um, usually a teammate or my mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my dad is better, but you gotta give him, like, 24 hours gotcha. for him to calm down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, that'll go south for both yeah, of us. Yeah, but um, that's important, right? Yeah. I feel like, so, like, we're going to get on, you'll, you'll see the kind of train that we're going on with it, but um, I guess just correlating the the mental health aspect of an athlete mm -hmm. to advocating, right? And and if you don't advocate, if you don't learn how to find your people or to go get help or to figure out something that, like, positively is going to help you, it's going to be a rough life, mm -hmm. not just sports, right? Like, life's yeah. going to be tough. So yeah. um, I think it's cool that that you found your people, right, that you yeah. can advocate for yourself. Yeah, and on my high, high school team, it was kind of hard because they do look at me as that relying person and the person that's supposed to know the answers and know everything. Um, so it was harder with my teammates in high school. But now in college, the beauty of my college team is that we have multiple people that can go off on any given night. Right. So, like, if even if I don't drop 20 or 15 or do anything in that game, my teammate could have 20. Yeah. And so we kind of all have that – you, you, we get ours, not yeah. you get your own, uh, which is really nice. But my teammate Lily and I, she's my rock, and I think if Lily didn't, Lily's a walk on. So if oh, Lily wow. didn't make the team last year, I don't know where I would be. Right time, right? <laughs> yeah. So that, and that's what I was going to transition to. So it's cool, right? Seeing you go through that as 
um, as a star, right, in high school, and now you're in college, like you said, now it's your freshman year, and there's nine seniors, you said, right? Mm -hmm. That's like a completely different type of like workforce to handle. But I think the coolest thing about you, um, just knowing you is how hard you work, right? And I don't think you ever shy from competition, right? Uh, but more importantly, I don't think you ever shy from wanting to be better, right? So talk a little bit more about your freshman year. Yeah, um, freshman year was definitely hard. So when we come in in the off season for the beginning of the year, we can't start practice till October 15th. So we started lifting the second week of school. We started playing pickup the second week of school. And I remember we shoot for teams. So you get in the gym and everybody lines up at the free throw line. You make one, you go one way. The next person makes one, goes yeah. the next. And I remember Coach Brooks was in the gym the first day of pickup and I airballed my free throw. And I, I was done after that. I just wanted to go home and cry. That's so funny. And everybody was making fun of me for it. I was like, great, this is really good. Um, so starting off from the very bottom, and even in my postseason meeting with Coach Brooks, she's like, watching you in pickup in September, I was worried. And I was like, I was worried too, don't you worry. Um, so it was very difficult to come in and no longer be the best person on the court, no longer have the will to do whatever you want with the ball, and somebody's there to stop you now. Right, so right. it was very a different level of physicality to mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. which made it very difficult. Um, and then sitting during games was probably the hardest That's part tough. and to not know if you're going to go in or not which comes with every freshman's experience for the most part unless you're a, really a bucket and then good for you yeah. um but it's having to sit there and like i was on that brink i'd play about like eight to ten minutes a game okay. so just sitting there and like waiting for her to look at the end of the bench mm -hmm. and just <laughs> holding yeah. on for dear life for, for when my name was going to be called so it's very nerve-wracking and then knowing you have a shorter leash like mm. the seniors have earned their spot they, they she knows what they can do so you go in as a freshman and the first mistake you make you're going back to the bench because right. you right. have a shorter leash less confidence in you mm -hmm. so also having that added pressure of knowing if i'm messing up well that's it right so it's a very different kind of stress and it was I would never ever go back to my freshman year. No, that's cool. So like when I think of it though, it's kind of cool. You had the best, but maybe the worst for some people in both worlds, right? You had the high school career that everybody dreams of, that they think they do, mm -hmm. right? As far as like you score a thousand, over a thousand. Are you the all-time winning scorer? Mm -hmm. All-time winning scorer every high school, right? Um, you're the star of the team, right? All this is deserving too, right? So everyone's like, wow, that's crazy. But also on the flip side, they're not realizing the pressures mm -hmm. that you have to like handle. And whether you embrace them all, all the time or not, they're there regardless, right? So then you transition to your freshman year and you're like, bro, I'm sitting. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not playing, I'm still practicing hard, I still want to get better, but like I'm not playing as much. And I don't know when I'm going to go in and if I go in, I don't want to mess up, mm -hmm. right? So you have like literally the best or the worst, I guess, however you want to look at it, of both worlds, which is cool. Um, before we leave the high school basketball topic, um, I call you 30 ball just because it's really funny you score 30 all the time, which is cool. So I want to talk about a couple things though. Um, what was one of your favorite games that you played in? Like what was one of your favorite moments? It had to be, um, I would say my 1,000 point game. My record breaking yeah. game was really cool too. Um, but my 1,000 point game, there was a built up anticipation. I think I needed 11 points to hit it and okay. I was telling everybody I wasn't going to get it. No, I take it back. It's my record game because which my one, wait, which yeah, wait. Go, you just tell me both. Yeah, my thousand point game. I needed eleven, and then I waited until like the last second, and my shot rattled like eight times before it went in, and that was <laughs> that was a thousand point. But like my all my brothers got to be at that one. Okay. Our entire student section was there, so that one was a lot of fun. And then my record breaking game, my dad was talking about it and saying I wasn't going to get it the night that I did because I needed 37 to hit yeah, it. Yeah, that's yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I needed yeah. 37. So he posted on Facebook and Instagram it was like we were playing at Ithaca the next day and they limited seating because of COVID, so okay. I wasn't going to get to have a fan section. Oh. So he's saying everybody come out to the game tonight at home. Brooke won't hit it tonight, but she'll hit it tomorrow. So let's have a nice send off. I was like, all right, screw you, Dad. I'm gonna right. do it tonight anyway. So you needed thirty-seven. How much did you get? Fifty. That's crazy. I had fifty. That's crazy. Yeah, it was a very good game, and my entire community was there, and my brothers couldn't be there, but at least one of them was. And it yeah, was, yeah. It was a very good night, and I was very grateful for everyone that came. That's so cool. All right, so after all this happens, right, the build up, you answer the call. Let's talk recruiting. Okay, what was your 
What was your recruitment process like? Yeah. Um, so I was on Twin Tier Elite, which is an AAU team out of Binghamton, and we went to a lot of NCAA certified tournaments mm -hmm. where coaches are sitting on the sidelines of your court, they're sitting underneath the basket, they're all decked out in their yeah. cool college gear. Um, so that was the first part, and then I was also active on like field level and the NCAA recruiting website and things like that. Um, I wasn't as good as I probably should have been. I didn't have an idea of where I wanted to go, so I didn't reach out to any schools. I kind of just let them come to me. Okay. Um, so I had a lot of coaches emailing me, calling me, texting me, um, and then I would just respond accordingly, and I had a list of questions that I had on my desk that I would ask everybody, and I would take notes on it, and I had the whole little spreadsheet because I'm that type of person. <laughs> um, so that was where the coaching aspect mm -hmm. took, and that was very, very scary, but yeah. then I started going on visits of schools with coaches, um, and then overnights, and I kind of weaned down my prom yeah, choices yeah. from there. Um, yeah, so, I, it's funny now, like, at my gym, obviously, you know, I train a bunch of kids, and um, a lot of them are going through that process, mm -hmm. and it's so funny for me hearing from the parents. I'm like, oh, how so-and-so, and they'll come to me with questions, and it can be a little rough. I mean, your your family's a little different because they have your older brothers that went through different mm -hmm. things college-wise, but parents struggle with that too, right? They get overwhelmed or they're not sure or they're like, what do we say? What should we do, mm -hmm. right? And they don't know. And then the kids genuinely, as they should, but they have no clue, right? So I think it's super important. That's like part of this advocating thing, right? If you want to play in sports or college, college um, sports in college, definitely find people that have done it mm -hmm. and that like did it properly so that you could ask that yeah. beforehand yeah right but it's tough because like it happens does it not happen so fast i feel like yeah um so what were some some schools that you were looking at yep um i was looking at gettysburg in pennsylvania okay. um ithaca corland's rival so we don't really talk about that one <laughs> um nazareth um misericordia damon um college of staten island there was a bunch that I applied to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, and so then the, the famous question would be, why Cortland? Why Cortland? Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't want to go to Cortland at all. Okay. <laughs> um, coming into my senior year, I told everybody, it's like, I'm just letting Cortland talk to me. I'm talking to them. Like, I don't want to go to Cortland because yeah. my town is so small. To go grocery shopping, to go clothes shopping, to literally do anything other than sit around a campfire, you have to go to Cortland. Literally. Um, so I didn't want to do that. I have already know Cortland. I already have been here. So I wanted to go somewhere else where my name wouldn't be known, mm -hmm. um, where I wouldn't have that added pressure of everybody knowing me and watching me at a close eye. Um, but when it came down to it, especially when it came to looking at financial aid packages, <laughs> Um, Cortland was my clear winner. Yeah. Um, my dad and I are the same person once again. So he made a spreadsheet and gave, listed all the criteria you could possibly want wow. for a college. And then each of my top four schools, and I had to rate them on a scale of one to 10 for each different category. And Cortland won out by like 85 points in the end. So oh, wow. yeah, I, it was going to be Cortland. I just wanted to lie to everybody and say it wasn't. That's cool. <laughs> um, let's talk Coach Brooks real quick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Cause I feel like we can't talk about recruiting processes in your your um, freshman year and that transition without that. Um, how was she? You know it's good. I mean? Like even in the recruiting process from that to coaching, right? How was it with her? Yeah, um, so Coach Brooks kind of had an easier recruiting process with me because I've been going to Cortland camp since I was very little. I went to all the prospect camps. I come to all the games. So she kind of had the easy go ahead at me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I kind of already knew her before the recruiting process even started. And okay. she even said that on our first phone call. She's like, I kind of have it easy with you because I already know you and I already know your family and I already watched you play all of your life. Right. Um, so that was kind of refreshing. But then she also said, but I'm still going to treat you like every other recruit. So like I got to come on a tour of Cortland, even though I've been on Cortland campus a thousand times and know all the buildings already. She, I went on an overnight and I stayed with all the girls and I got to go through all of the things that come with the overnight. So she still treated me like I was a recruit, even That's though awesome. I've been here and know it, which is really cool. Um, the hard thing with Coach Brooks is that when you commit to a school, you kind of have it in your idea, a mind set that you're going to play for the same person for four years. Right. So when she told us that she was leaving, it was kind of like, a take back. Like yeah. I hadn't really gotten to know her that well as a coach. Like I only played her for one played for her for one year. Didn't really get to play that much because I was a freshman. 
Um, so I didn't have as hard of an adjustment with her leaving as many of our older players that played with her for four years did. Right. Um, but it was still hard having that change in mindset to go from, oh, I'm not playing the same style of basketball that I just spent my entire year learning for the right. next four years. But it, it was what was best for her. We all knew that she wanted to play uh, Coach D1, and yeah. this is kind of a step in that direction. So Absolutely. Um, so well, let's segue right into your sophomore year. Um, talk about that. Like, what was it like going into your sophomore year? New coach, new right? Coach. Um, obviously some new teammates, because that's just what happens every year mm -hmm. in basketball teams and college and stuff. Um, so talk a little bit about that, and um, kind of cool, because you had a lot of success this year. Mm -hmm. So yeah, talk about the coach, team, all that. Um, so when we knew Coach Brooks was leaving, our immediate question was, who was our next coach going to be? Um, I think we had over 100 applicants for our job or something like that, maybe it was 85. Somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually got to be there for our four finalist interviews. They had they brought them into the Hall of Fame room, and they all, all the people in the athletic department got to come and be a part of like questioning and answering and giving input. So I got to be there for our four finalists, and I was really glad that they picked Coach Ames because she was one of my top two after awesome. the interviews. So I was very happy. Um, and she kind of just plays the style that I more am accustomed to playing. It's the way my AAU team played, the way I like playing. So I was very happy when she got the job. Um, but no one expected us to be any good this year because we did lose nine seniors. We only returned six people. Mm -hmm. And of those six people, only two of us played more than 10 minutes. Wow. Yeah, so it was going to be a very – or sorry, three of us played more than 10 minutes. I played 10 minutes. So, um, so nobody really expected us to be anything. Um, and then we came out and we started – Conference play, I think seven and zero, oh, and we wow. beat New Paltz, who was the, yeah, the, top, yeah. the top team. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of like, whoa, that's we're, crazy. We're gonna be good this year. Um, me personally, walking into sophomore year, I was like, all right, no more seniors, no more excuses. This is this is my time, my turn. Um, so we had walked into our first scrimmage, and coach gave us the starting lineup, and I was like, okay, I guess I guess it is go time. It's <laughs> like, all right, now we're going. Um, but it was a very good start to our year. Um, it was definitely an adjustment the first four games of our season, having to have that responsibility of being a contributor and scoring again. Yeah, but yeah. It was a, I came to embrace it, and by the end of the season, I was very comfortable being on the court. Yeah, I think that's who you are, right? And kind of to tie it all back together, that's why it kind of makes you smile. It's like it kind of went full circle for you, mm -hmm. right? And now it's like it's almost like you had all this so much like added pressure at such a young age for so long, right? Then you finally got like a window to breathe and like, well, I'm in college, I gotta figure this out. And now we're back into like, bro, we need you again, mm -hmm. right? But the coolest thing about that to me is like, you were always that. Like you could always score 30 if need be, right? You could always do that, but you had to take a seat and be like, yo, I gotta transition into college, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about how competitive D3 basketball is. Um, I don't know, do you know Justin Cooper? No. Um, he played basketball. Oh, yes I do. Yeah, yeah, Sorry, yeah. he goes okay. by Coop. Yeah, Coop. Coop, Coop yeah. yeah. Um, so I had him on the podcast this morning. Oh. And we were talking about this, and um, uh, I was like, you know, obviously he trains people and stuff mm -hmm. like that, talking people from like little kids to like pros. And he played a court, and obviously like, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, bro, you gotta tell the people how competitive is D3 basketball, especially like in SUNY Acts. And um, it's so ironic to me because people just don't think, they think like, I, I seriously think everyone thinks like if you're playing a division three sport, you can just play it like off the couch. You can't. Mm -hmm. So like talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, my favorite, Coach Brooks always told us, she obviously wants to be a D1 coach someday, but she always talks about how much she loves D3 because everybody that's here is here because they want to be. Yeah. You're not here on scholarship. You're not getting any money for playing basketball. You're donating countless, probably like 15 to 20 hours a week just to play basketball, taking away from school, taking away from friends and family. Um, so it's very competitive because everybody that's there wants to be there yeah. and wants to play and wants to work hard. Um, I would argue that I would, I would rather play D3 than D2 or D1 any day um, solely for that reason. Like in high school, my teammates more played because it was something to do, not because it was something they wanted to do. Right. Um, so going to college and being there with surrounded by 15, 16 girls that had the same exact desire to win and the same exact joy and passion for the sport, there's nothing like it. And then playing against people that have that same passion, then it gets competitive if you saw yeah. the 
<laughs> Bless you, South Carolina. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's D1 pressure fueling that fight. But the right. same thing happens in D3. We keep our emotions in check just a little bit better than they did. But it, it happens, and it's very competitive no matter what level you go. Yeah, and, um, and I think that's cool that you brought that up, that emotional side of it all, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, from a fan perspective, they get it because they're there for the entertainment, mm -hmm. legitimately, right? Or they're there because... Well, I'm Brooks' cousin's cousin, I'm just here to watch her play, <laughs> yeah. right? But they don't understand, and we'll talk about a little bit, but like, what we put in to this, mm -hmm. and for what. We're not getting paid, you know what I'm saying? We're not getting money from it, and so, yeah, like, if we get a little emotionally riled up, it's bigger than just like, I'm mad right now. Mm -hmm. It's like, do you know what I did <laughs> to be here, right, to be in this moment? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's pretty cool. Um, and we touched, touched on it a little bit, but um, just like that mental health aspect in sports and I think um, you're you're in a really cool uh, light with it right now because I think for you, right, this is when I picture you and I think of college basketball, I think uh, she's got to do what she's got to do on the court. She works hard, right, so it's like off the court stuff, whether it's lifts and like, whether it's like basketball specific stuff, whatever, running, everything. But then, <laughs> then we were just talking about before this, but like your major, like what you do in school is hard enough. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance all of that? Yeah, uh, I have very, very good time management skills. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm one of those people that I have my day planned out to like the 30 minute mark. Um, so I have classes from like nine to, I have a very nice schedule this semester. So I have classes to like nine to 11, 10. And then I have my research lab from 12 to two. Mm -hmm. And then I get a nice little break. And then if we're in season, we have practice four to six or whatever like that, a two hour block and mm -hmm. end of the day. Mm -hmm. And then dinner, shower, homework until I want to sleep. Um, so it's a very ruling schedule, but at the same time, if I don't follow that schedule, then I know I'll be more upset with myself and have more pressure. So I stick to my schedule and I'm usually good about that. And what's nice about my team is that we're all friends. So like, I don't need to build in time to hang out with people because my schedule builds it in for me because I'm with them at lift for an hour a day or I'm with them at practice yeah. for two hours a day mm -hmm. or some of my teammates are even in my major. So I have them in my classes. So that's the nice part is if you do love your team like I love mine, it's, it helps itself. For sure. Um, I kind of want to touch a little bit about this too. Um, AU, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, pros and cons to it. I think right now it's still one of those things where people like love and hate. Mm -hmm. There's not really like a middle ground with it. Um, me personally, like I don't really, I don't really, I might have played AU a little bit, but not really. Um, but it's just because I was doing other stuff and basketball wasn't like my focus. But for you, how beneficial was it for you to play AU? It was very beneficial for me. Um, I played local AU, I played with CMI Heat, and my coach Murphy, Janice, mm -hmm. Lindsay, Minor, Alt, or Kearney, sorry, uh, all, the, all the people that helped me with CMI Heat, yeah. um, they did a great job, but there's only so much you can do playing locally. You're not playing those big teams. You're not playing people in different states with different right. competition levels. So um, when I started playing with Twin Tier and we started going to NCAA tournaments, I was like, okay. I went to my first NCAA certified tournament, and I remember I worked out with Lindsay the next day, and I we shot twice, and Lindsay looked at me, she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I just broke down crying. I'm like, I don't think I can play in college. Like these girls were eating me alive. I was, it was bad. I'm bad. It's bad. Yeah, yeah. And Lindsay's like, whoa, settle down right. and talk me off the edge. Yeah, Lindsay's um, awesome. yeah I love Lindsay and both. They're both. Great. Yeah, they're both. Um, so then I was, then I went to my next tournament and it got better and I slowly adjusted and I got better myself until I was no longer scared of the other people and they were more scared of me. So right. it was, it just took time to adjust, but I solely believe I would not be at Cortland if it wasn't for my AU team. Yeah, um, and yeah, I think that's that's why I want to touch on it, right? Is because I think um, you're you're in a really cool light right now, but there's kids that are, uh, whether girls or boys, that are like looking up to you and looking up to you as far as even like, yo, I want to play D1, I want to play D2, like I want to get on scholarship, right? Um, what would you say are some things that you would advise them, right? Like on top of AU or just whatever it is, what would you say to get like a scholarship look even? Yeah, um, I would say be your biggest advocate for yourself. 
Um, most people think when you think about college recruiting that coaches are going to be calling you, you're going to be getting your phone blown up after you have this really good game and they're all going to be watching you. Um, but that's not true. <laughs> college, especially if you're from like a small town or right. even like Portland, who's a B or A school now, and they're mm -hmm. still, you're not relevant as like the big kids at private schools. That's so true. Um, so going to tournaments, make sure you're emailing coaches that you're interested in, telling them your schedule, telling them where you are, attaching highlight films. Um, doing the work for yourself early, but even before you do that, I would make sure that you want to play D1 or D2. I think a lot of people fall in love with the fact of saying that I got a D1 scholarship or I got a D2 scholarship so you yeah. can brag about it someday later on, but not a lot of people think about the difference in the commitment levels between D1, D2, D3. Right. Like, some of my schedule is still pretty grueling. Like we're in the off season now and we're lifting three times a week and playing pickup four or five times a week. So even though we're not in season, we're still doing something every single day. Right. And that's all volunteer. That's because we want to, when you get to the T2 D1 levels, that's not volunteer. You're doing mm -hmm. that because your coach is telling you because it's mandated because right. you're told. Right. Um, so making sure that that's what you want to do. And then especially if you're going D1, you're traveling every weekend, you're missing school, you're missing classes. You're making up work, having to make up tests, and realizing that even though you're playing D1, you're sacrificing your scholarship or your academics. Mm -hmm. So being aware of what you're getting into before you get into it. Yeah, I think you said it great, and I love the word that you said, yeah, sacrifice, right? Because no matter what level, JUCO, D3, D2, D1, um, there's this element of sacrifice that has to be made. And um, I had my friend um, Morgan up here on a podcast. Um, she went JUCO and then D1, she played lacrosse. And she kind of explained that, that jump, right? And the commitment level, like you said, what she was telling me was nuts to me. Mm -hmm. But that was average for her. Like, that was like, yeah, but we had to do that. You know, that was like a prerequisite almost. <laughs> um, and it makes me laugh because I can't wait for kids that say they want to play or think that they're there to do that, to hear that. Because then that's when it kicks in, like, is this really something that you really want to pursue? Mm -hmm. Because even if you do get there, which I hope they all do, um, the sacrifice that has to be made has to be made, whatever it is, yeah. no matter how big. Um, so this is like probably my favorite part of every episode that I have. Um, I ask everybody this question and I'd love to just to hear it. Um, but can you think of a time in your life where, um, where you went through something pretty tough, right? And um, this is like my pain loss segment, right? And the reason why I ask people this is because I firmly believe, and I'm sure you probably agree, that um, if you can make it through that, it can mold you into a completely different person, mm -hmm. uh, usually better than you were before. Um, and there's so much that you learn through that adversity. And there's sometimes so many different people that you meet that you wouldn't think that you met um, through that. So um, can you think of a time in your life that was painful, tough? Or you just experience loss of some sort, right, that kind of push you to be who you are now? Yeah. I would say my uh, first semester of my freshman year. Yeah. Um, going in, like I already said, imposter syndrome, like thinking everybody was expecting more of me than I could give them, that I my accolades and everything I earned wasn't deserved. It was just because I was someone in a small town that had some sort of minor ability to do something. Um, and my freshman year was very hard. I only lived 20 minutes away, but I think out of all of our freshman class on the team, it hit me the worst. And even my friends from high school, like they loved college. They were having the time of their lives. And I was sitting there in my dorm room, upset and sad and crying every night mm -hmm. and not being able to go home when I wanted to, because you have to go through that adjustment. You have to be there to figure it out on your own. And then we had 7 a.m. conditioning and six or 7 a.m. conditioning and then lifts afterwards. So we were getting up every morning and nothing like getting up at 7 a.m. to make you really <laughs> question if Seriously, you want to be there. Right? Um, so that was a really big struggle. And it was to the point where my mom was like, I can't come see you anymore if you're going to cry every time you get out of my car. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. Mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then you get through it and yeah. we came back from winter session so we got our week-long christmas break and we did something this was coach brooks's mo we did game sim so the first day back from winter break you get that week-long break and we have a four-quarter game with no basketball it's just mm. running okay. so she you sprint forward you sprint backwards she's blowing the whistle you're jumping up to rebound you're taking the charge you're defensive sliding it's 
four quarters of hell. It's bad. Yeah, that sounds and good. So we got to the room locker room before that, and somebody had told us because we were freshmen, we didn't know they're like after games and we get to go home. It's like we do that four quarter simulation, then we're done. And I started crying. I was like, I needed that. I was like, I really needed that. But yeah, my freshman year was really rough. I think if I wasn't already at the school closest to home, I probably would have transferred. Would have transferred back yeah. There. Um, but once it got to my spring season, and I kind of made those connections with those people because first semester you don't really know anybody like. You kind of know the people in your classes, you kind of know your teammates, but nobody's your best friend yet. You don't have anybody that you can talk to about, oh, I had a really bad day. There's nobody that you have that confidence with yet. Um, but by spring semester, I had that and I made it through. And like I said before, there you could not pay me enough to go back to my first semester of freshman year. <laughs> but cool. now, sophomore year, my mom is, is the opposite way. She's, I get out of her car and she's like, you're just going to go? Like, you're, you're not going to say goodbye to me? I'm like, oh, last year you were yelling at me for not right. getting out of the car. And now, now we're backwards. But you just have to get through the hard times. And then if I had never had the hard freshman year, I would never appreciate the good sophomore year I'm having now. Absolutely. Um, and I was just going to say that I think it's cool how you can kind of tie that in, right? How you can go from um, kind of a, just not even like a struggle of a freshman year, but just a transition, we'll call it that, more than anything. Um, and you pushing through it, getting through that transition, um, and then into now. So let's talk a little bit quick about sophomore accolades. Okay, so what what did you receive after your year this year? Um, so I was nominated, or I was first team all conference, and I was also student yet defensive player of the year. So how cool is that though? Like those are dope. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? To me, I think that's that's fire. But. How cool is it like in just a two year really year and a half span, right? The change of your mentality, right? We talk about like the mental health awareness stuff of an athlete. Um, you actively being like, yo, I'm gonna get through this. And then obviously your work ethic was what it was and is what it is, right? And so I think it's so cool to me how you could combine all three of those, the team one, right? So all of these things are starting to kind of like come together full circle right and, and everything that you're doing is coming to fruition i think that's cool because you're a sophomore right mm -hmm. it's not like you're senior and it's done right so then my next question is like what are goals that you have either for yourself or for your team yeah um for myself i want to keep my defensive player of the year title yeah. for at least one more year yeah. brianna fitzgerald who's from new Paltz, she is a crazy good athlete she gets player of the year for one more year and then Hopefully my senior year, I'm aiming for player of the year. We'll see. That'd be awesome. It'd be really cool. Um, as a team, we really want SUNYACs. Yeah. 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 Um, I said this, and we had our end of season team meeting, and everybody in our room that's returning has the potential to win three SUNYACs in their time at Cortland. Wow. Because all of our freshman class won one their first year. All of our soft freshmen this year lost their first one, but if we win the next three, everybody has the opportunity to win three in their time. Crazy. So that's my personal goal is I want to go three for four, 75% for SUNY X is pretty good. That'd be awesome. That'd be really cool. Um, and Coach Ames always says this. She's like, our overall goal is always going to be a national championship, especially right. now that our football team just did it. Yeah, like everybody, yeah, so everybody cool. wants to be next. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, but she always tells us, she's like, obviously it's not going to happen. It could happen, but it's not going to happen in the next three years. But you're setting up the next people for it. So like it might not happen in your time here, but it'll happen because of you and because of the things you did for the people after you. Right. Which I think is really cool. So SUNYAC first, but then hopefully national championship and eventually. Then, yeah, and it's definitely possible, right? Like you never know. And more important, like if you just kind of keep stacking the days and keep doing what you're doing, it's gonna work out. Um, so in closing, um, I mean we kind of touched on it a little bit, but just one more time for the people that are gonna watch and listen. Um, what's some advice that you give? And this is so, it seems so general, but it happens all the time to just a freshman that's just struggling, whether it's sports or not, right? What's just some advice that you would give? Yeah, everybody has a bad freshman year. Um, even those who don't have like a particularly bad freshman year, it's still a big adjustment. You're living by yourself. You're taking college courses with professors that don't know your name. You're, <laughs> you're taking harder courses unless you're a very easy major, in which, <laughs> which I envy you. <laughs> um, but it's going to be hard no matter what you do. Yeah. So if you just keep getting through the day, there's one day at a time, one step at a time, and always having something to look forward to. Like, even if you know you're going to have a really bad week, schedule something on your Saturday or something on your Sunday that gives you something to look forward to. So that, that way the days don't seem as long. 
Um, and then for basketball, I would say your freshman year isn't indicative of your next three. So you could not have played a single minute and you could still come back and have the best sophomore year ever. You could have had the best freshman year ever and get an injury and not play the rest of your years. Um, so just take everything personally, but don't let it fuel everything that you do. So your freshman year is not going to set you up for the rest of your life. You take what happens your freshman year and you make it from there. Absolutely. I think you are the epitome of everything you just said, right? And and like, that's my goal. My goal is in hopes that like someone that needs to hear that can hear that now, is that um, like, not only are you saying it, but it's you like now, right? Like currently, it'd be different if it was me talking about college or high school, right? That's forever ago. But for you, these are things that you're literally actively going through. And then also for, um, this is cool too, for like coaches and, and even adults and people that watch this too, right? To see that like someone that's currently going through this stuff um, can get through it, right? And and someone that was a star, bro, like a star of every, you were everything to people around here, right? Can still struggle, mm -hmm. right? And um, and I think it's super, super cool that everything's kind of gone full circle for you already. So um, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you. you for everything. And um, I truly appreciate you, but um, I just hope the best for you in your future. Thank you. Yeah, great job.